I'd like to now take this opportunity to introduce to you Naren Albrecht. Naren has recently joined our team as a Senior Policy Analyst for Community Energy, and he will be working closely with KELP. Naren, over to you. Thanks, Leah. Good morning, everyone. Um, just a quick check-in. Can everyone hear us? Is everyone hearing us? We're so, oh, we're all muted. Yeah, perfect. Great. So it's quiet. So great. So we'll just we'll get into it. Thanks for joining us this morning, um, and it's great to be uh, great to be here and uh, on the team. So the Ministry of Energy and Mines has uh, contracted the BC Sustainable Energy Association to develop materials that will contribute to the success of the Community Energy Leadership Program through providing an applicant's handbook and this webinar with a goal to help increase the diversity and quality of the projects submitted for funding. The applicant's handbook aims to provide a greater depth of information than currently available through our existing program guide. It will assist program ap applicants in proposing projects that are more innovative and inspiring and will ensure program criteria are being appropriately addressed. In other words, um, to assist communities prepare stronger CALP funding applications. Um, just an update on the applicant's handbook. It is uh, currently under development and will be ready for in the spring. And questions from this webinar will inform the handbook, which will be available for the next CALP funding intake. I'd like to take, to take this opportunity now to turn the webinar over to Jessica. Good morning, everyone. And I just want to apologize. My slides don't seem to be advancing. So I'm going to try to close out the presentation slides and reopen them. Okay, there we go. Apologies for that. I just wanted to touch base with everybody on the GoToMeeting software as we get started. So please do mute yourself unless it is time for you to speak. We do have the controls to mute uh, the participants as well. So do double check if you are muted before you would like to speak. So you have a control panel, which will look like the one on the slide, and it allows you to to mute yourself, to see the other attendees, and down at the bottom is the chat window. So do use the chat window if you need to raise your hand um, or interject or when it's time to ask a question. If you have dialed in using the computer audio and your audio does fail or disconnect and um, you're not able to reconnect using that computer audio, you can dial in using the phone number that was provided and still be able to connect to the audio and, and use the screen and the computer to see the slides. And uh, lastly, in that chat window, if you need to contact uh, or, or direct something to one of the organizers or individuals, you can message the whole group or message an individual if you have something you need to raise. So what we're going to be covering this morning is the expanded criteria that, that we looked into when we were doing the work on behalf of the ministry. And that criteria helped us look into a number of case studies, which we reviewed, looking for uh, stories of success to share with everyone. We'll go over the key learnings from those case studies, some other things to consider for your application, and then have a good chance for a long Q&A at the end. So in the work that the BCSEA did, we were looking for case studies that would serve as examples of success stories or examples of inspiration, and we focused on criteria that are beyond the basic program requirements. So some of the other areas we felt should be considered included the broader project value. So what is the value to community and innovation, the opportunity to contribute to the growth of a local industry? Is there a clear understanding on how the project can assist in building a greater social and economic value? How the project relates to energy system needs? Does it provide what's defined as dependable capacity? And does the timing of that meet the system needs? So dependable capacity can be considered the maximum output of the energy system that can be reliably produced when it's required and reliably meaning that there is a high level of confidence in the output being available at the system peak need. Does the project promote fuel switching? So fuel switching is generally 
considered to be the switching from a lower efficiency and higher polluting fuel source to a cleaner and more efficient one. So typically the move from a fossil fuel to a clean and renewable energy source. What are the clear greenhouse gas reductions and energy savings potential that the project provides? And does it all result in an overall contribution to market transformation to a low carbon economy? We're now going to have our policy director, Tom Hackney, run through some of the details and highlights of the case studies that we provided. Thank you, Jessica, and hello to everybody. If you will bear with me, I have four case studies to go through, hopefully quickly, hopefully very interesting, and then a, a little bit of advice about getting help with uh, building envelope upgrades. So number one is the Gordon Head Recreation Center in the District of Saanich. And this is a, a typical uh, municipal rec center with a large pool and other facilities. When Saanich needed to replace end of life heating plant, they could have minimized the upfront costs and gone with gas boilers, but instead with the help of kelp funding, the district sought expert engineering advice to see what they could do to maximize efficiency and minimize greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the engineer gave Saanich a range of options from gas boilers to uh, ground source heat pumps, and they finally chose an air source heat pump powered by renewable electricity, courtesy of BC Hydro, because they're on the grid. The size and cost of the heat pump was optimized by having a small gas-fired backup system to help with the, the times of peak load. And Saanich chose to offset the emissions from that backup power by buying carbon-neutral renewable natural gas. The district also installed energy efficiency net, including a building recommissioning that optimized air handling and other systems. A reduced operating costs mean that the heat pump system is about as cost effective as a natural gas boiler system over a 25 year life, but the energy usage and greenhouse gas emissions are much less. So by thinking holistically, and planning for the long term, getting energy efficiency expertise and spending a bit more money up front has achieved a superior retrofit and greatly lightened its environmental footprint. Heat pumps are established technology, but using them in a, to heat a swimming pool is, is innovative. And this approach could be applied uh, to many municipalities across BC where there are similar facilities. So, um, number two, Kodacha Bioenergy System. Uh, the Kodacha Nation lives in Fort Wayne, about 570 kilometers north of St. George. Being off BC Hydro's grid, Kodacha Nation gets its electricity from diesel generators that burn over 750,000 liters of fuel per year. This makes electricity very expensive. However, many homes use inefficient baseboard electric heaters, and most of the community buildings uh, rely on propane for heat. So in 2010, Kodacha Nation teamed up with the BC Bioenergy Network to develop an energy concept. At the same time, Kodacha worked with BC Hydro and Aboriginal Affairs and Northern Development Canada to improve energy efficiency. Insulation and other measures are expected to reduce the overall energy demand by a fifth, and then moving to the the heat plant system, the bioenergy system, was developed with kelp funding, and it consists of three uh, gasifier and combined heat and power units that will provide 135 kilowatts of electrical power and 270 kilowatts of heat. The generators will run on locally sourced wood chips, 
and the exhaust heat will be used uh, to heat the community school building and greenhouses. The electricity is sold to BC Hydro through a negotiated agreement and it's, it's geared, it's sized to, to fit the Kodacha Nation situation. So there was some negotiation and planning with BC Hydro on the sizing of that. Most of the uh, community's propane use and a third of the diesel will be displaced and dead pines in the area will be put to beneficial use. The plant will provide two and a half full-time jobs with additional seasonal work to supply the wood fuel. So as with Spanish, Kodacha Nation has thought holistically about their energy needs, engaged appropriate energy expertise, and chosen an option that would maximize efficiency and minimize greenhouse gas emissions. Bioenergy is, uh, systems are relatively new to North America. Uh, this system could be replicated around BC, especially where there is available biomass and where it would displace diesel fuel generation that is typical of off-grid situations in northern BC. Moving on, uh, number three, uh, in contrast to Saanich and Kodacha, the energy focus of Nelson's community solar garden is public outreach and engagement. With the help of kelp funding, the city of Nelson capitalized on its ownership of the local electrical utility, creating a financing model that allows utility customers to buy into a community-run solar photovoltaic generation facility uh, under construction in the slide that you see there. Any, any Nelson Hydro customer may invest at the level of their choice and in return they get a credit on their electricity bills for the energy generated. Nelson estimates the simple payback period to be 12 to 15 years uh, the project is very popular. 250 panels have been subscribed for the first phase and the investors include schools, colleges, churches, co-ops, businesses, residents who own and residents who rent. Uh, the funding model appears to be a Canadian first and it could be replicated by any municipality that owns its own electrical utility. A shortcoming is that the generation here in Nelson will mostly displace existing renewable grid power, so it would be better located in an off-grid situation where it would displace diesel fuel generation. However, in the long run, uh, as BC moves toward the deep greenhouse gas emission cuts that will require displacing more and more of our fossil fuel resources, there could be an increasing demand for this kind of situation in on-grid uh, applications. Now my fourth uh, case study, uh, when a fire forced the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority to displace the housing for its hospital staff in Bella Bella, it looked for a way to maximize energy efficiency and minimize energy bills. The authority retained Red Door Energy Design and Britco, which is a Langley-based design company. The result was Canada's first multi-unit modular building to achieve the exacting passive house energy efficiency standard. Passive house uses super efficient building envelope to virtually eliminate the need for space heating equipment. Without exceeding the construction budget, the project is saving thousands each year in running costs, and on a cold day, uh, a unit can be heated by the equivalent of six 100-watt light bulb. By taking an ambitious approach on energy, Coastal Health tapped into cutting-edge BC expertise on building energy efficiency design. The Passive House standard is still quite new to North America and BC. And the BC Bella Bella project 
demonstrates that this model can be widely applicable in DC, especially where heating costs are high. Finally, I'd like to make a couple of suggestions on building energy, uh, building envelope retrofits. The uh, previous examples have addressed energy system efficiency upgrades for existing buildings and a building envelope upgrade in a new build situation. Upgrading envelope efficiency of existing buildings can be somewhat more challenging. Existing buildings are often not designed to be properly airtight, to be well insulated, or even to avoid undue moisture buildup in their wall cavities. Achieving these after the fact can be difficult and labor intensive, and it's not surprising that many energy retrofits often concentrate on switching out the heating and ventilating equipment where the dollar and cost savings can be relatively quick and easy. But we suggest here that a thorough retrofit project should look for deep energy savings, not just the lowest hanging fruit, and if you're investing up front, that can yield years of reduced operating costs and emissions and improved building performance, including a more comfortable experience for the building occupants. Professional engineers are qualified to make detailed assessments of energy retrofit options for your buildings, including technology choices, costs, energy savings, and greenhouse gas reductions. This is a growing field. Some firms are now specializing in it. The BC's Association of uh, Professional Engineers and Geoscientists provides listings of its members. As always, though, word of mouth recommendation can be the most valuable. We strongly recommend also that you contact BC's utilities for advice. BC Hydro has well-established programs and a long track record. Fortis Gas Utility has programs that are focusing on, on gas efficiency. And if you are located in the Fortis Electric Utilities Service Territory, they too offer programs. So that's my talk. And uh, back to you, Jessica. Great, thank you, Tom. So the key learnings from these case studies include the importance of taking a holistic approach. So thinking of the whole energy system, where efficiencies can be gained and conservation measures put in place before looking at possible new energy supply options. The importance of technology integration. So we find that there is greater success when you look at a systems approach to renewable energy or energy efficiency technologies and looking for the combinations of, of these technologies. So where energy efficiency and conservation retrofits could be improved through heating and cooling systems in combination with renewable generation, or renewable generation ensuring it's in combination with storage and smart grid integration. To look for means of creative financing to not only ensure the project success, but also to help develop greater connection to the communities. So creative financing being the uncommon or untraditional means of financing a project. And in the examples we saw, they included a community share purchasing program. It could also include establishing an investment or project development co-op. So this helps overcome financial barriers, helps create local ownership, and does help greater project success. Looking for project execution efficiencies. So where can costs, time, and difficulty be reduced through partnerships? innovative and creative solutions, and new means of method, sorry, new methods of construction and project development. And also to ensure that you're using professional guidance and assessment. So ensure an energy audit has been completed with energy use assessments in advance of, in advance of any planning. Beyond the points of, of key success for designing the project itself, we wanted to include some of the broader key areas for successful applications. So be sure to be clear and concise in the application. Explain exactly what is being planned, why it is needed, and how it meets all of the criteria. 
Ensure all the financial pieces are in place. So there's signed agreements and a clear explanation of where funds are coming from, as well as a sound project budget. Have a detailed understanding of how the project contributes to community resiliency. So how has the community been engaged in the decision-making process and project selection? And how will the project through its lifetime and beyond increase community connections? Detail how the project is innovative and what aspects are new in terms of the application of a technology, the design concepts, or the components. And how can this innovation be leveraged to increase the clean energy industry activities in the community? Is there clear replicability? So does it provide an example for other communities to learn from and execute a similar project themselves, as well as providing further projects and examples within the community itself? Expanding on the idea of innovation, does the project spark creativity and a sense of imagination, both in the technical development and community, community connection pieces? So now we'd like to open things up for a question and answer session. So what we'd like to do is use the chat window to indicate that you would like to ask a question. So you can type directly into that chat window the word question or the words hands up and we will keep track of the names that come up on that list. We will say your name and indicate that it's your turn to ask a question, and then you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Uh, we will also pause and check in with the people on the phone in case there's people on the phone who don't have a computer access as well. Great, and we see that there's a hand up already from Darla Simpson. Hey there. Um, I'm just wondering, in terms of the, um, the matching funding, um, would you include things like grants to complete energy audits from BC Hydro as part of that matching funding, or um, can you be a bit more explicit about what matching funding is, constitutes? Did everybody hear that? Yeah, Christina, would you like to answer that question? You mentioned from BC. Oh, sorry, you're just unmuted. Oh, can everyone hear me now? Yeah, you're there. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks. Sorry. Uh, hi, Darla. It's Christina from Energy and Mines here. The um, the matching funding that you mentioned from BC Hydro that could be accounted. Um, anything that you've needed or that that you need basically to design and construct the project would be considered matching funding. So if there's um, some in-kind resources that you're using to manage um, the project development from within your own community staff resources, that could be included. Um, and then obviously any, um, any financing that you get for construction costs or, or funding from other sources would count towards uh, matching funding. Perfect, thank you. Great, do we have any other questions? Is there anyone on the phone that would like to speak up? Um, well, I'm on the phone, this is George Colgate calling. Um, and I don't know exactly how to access any of the buttons. Can I? Are you? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure how to make this thing work. Um, I had um, I had a couple of just uh, questions on the funding application, um, yeah, and I'll just have to. It was just basically. Um, some of the boxes that they're supposed to fill out, I'm not quite sure how to make those um, sort of fill in. Um, Hi, George. So it's Leah here. Hi, Leah. Hi. Um, those boxes, should all of the boxes on the application should be fillable. Um, if you're having difficulties with them, um, we can connect um, privately if you want, and they can kind of help you through that. Okay. They should yeah. all be fillable fields, though. What's that? They should all be fillable fields. 
<laughs> yeah, well, the boxes are still, it's the, um, it's the little boxes. For example, uh, right at the very beginning there, there was um, uh, little boxes. Uh, please check to confirm that your application will meet all mandatory criteria, et cetera, et cetera. So there's little, these little squares. And what, you just put an X on them, because when I highlight them, they don't really uh, do very much. And I think there if was... You uh, click, if you just uh, click on that box, it'll mark with an X on its own. Oh, will it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, mine didn't. Uh, actually, some of them did and some of them didn't. I think um, there was another one, Section G, I think, down at the bottom where I was having... Um... Okay, George, maybe we can connect privately. It might be an operating system issue, yeah. and I'd, I'd be happy to walk you through that. Okay, yeah, that's... Uh... That's I. I'll, I'll, I had some other question, but I'll I'll let somebody else go. I'll I'll find it and, and I'll give it. Okay, back. George, I'll be available all day today. Bye. Okay. You can just give me my office line a call. You bet. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. We've got a question from Leslie, and she's asking if um, if there if the applicant does not have an energy audit um, completed for the December fifteenth intake, does that kick? them out of the program? And I'll let Christina officially answer that question, or Leah. Uh, hi, it's Christina here. So it, I guess it depends on the project, but we, it's not, it's definitely not a mandatory requirement. So if, um, you know, if you haven't done an energy audit, but you've done some other planning that, um, that puts you in a position where you have a well-designed project that you can submit uh, for the December application, then I'd say for sure, please, go ahead and submit. Uh, I think the energy audit recommendation was just primarily for folks doing quite intensive energy efficiency retrofits, and it was just some advice to help communities um, identify what retrofits might be the most uh, appropriate. Uh, but if you've arrived at your project design in a different way with a different planning or design process, then, then that's fine too. I'd, I'd just highlight that in your application to us. Does that answer Great. Thank you. Are there any other questions from someone who's connected on the phone? Uh, Michelle, hello? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I had a question regarding the uh, Section 4.2.0. Um, we have two... Sorry, I just got to turn my computer down. We have two uh, components to our project. One that is is scalable in terms of of uh, actually calculating the the uh, amount of energy that we're saving, and the other part is is water saving, which we don't really have a formula to figure out how much energy that we would save by saving the water, other than calculating uh, how much it costs to produce the water. Uh, but it is a significant amount of water that we're saving and and would have an impact on energy use. Is there is there anything specific that we could use for that? I, I don't think we have um, we have anything off the top of my head for converting that water savings to energy savings, but uh, what I'd suggest is in the um, in the application, if you can, um, just highlight what your calculation is or your estimates are for water savings, then we take that into account in our evaluation. Um, okay. Yeah. And then that would that would go into the, the part three of that, that questionnaire was uh, what is the cost per ton of GHG emissions based on kelp funding? I'm not really understanding how to make that calculation. Yeah, right now you just use your emissions. Um, I'm wondering, you know, as we're talking, just because they're, they're, I guess, two weeks left until folks have to submit, it might be worth, um, if you have that number right now or some explanation around the emissions and the water savings, if you're able to email that to the kelp inbox, then um, we can chat with one of our engineers here to see if we can get an actual calculation for what the emissions reductions or energy reductions would be associated okay. with water reductions, and then 
you could use that, uh, assuming it would be a larger number, that larger number for the application. Okay. How do I access the kelp inbox? So there will be a post at the end of this Q&A with how to contact us, but it's kelp, C-E-L-P at gov.bc.ca. Oh, okay. So just using an email. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. You'll, you'll reach all of us there at that, at that okay. email. Thank you. And then we'll, we'll turn something around for you in you know, like three to five days. Yeah. Thing. Oh, yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. It's a great question. Um, where, where exactly, what, I, where are we talking about on, the, on this calculating the greenhouse gases? I don't seem to have something like that on my application. In the program guide. Uh, what section is it? Um, it's not. It isn't a mandatory criteria. Um, it's just a it's section 4.2.0 on page 9 of the program guide. 4. It isn't what? Section 4.2.0. Oh, okay. Second or two. Oh, okay. Okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's what, yeah. So um, I had a question there, and um, what is the cost per ton based on kelp funding? That's what, I wasn't quite sure what you meant by based on kelp funding. Because it's so a percentage of... I think we're just looking for take the, the kelp dollar amount that proponents are asking for and divide it by the emissions that the project will achieve, emissions reductions, sorry, that the project will achieve. So it's kelp dollars divided by greenhouse gases uh, per ton of greenhouse gases reduced? Correct, yeah. Okay. And I don't remember if we asked proponents to do that or if that's a calculation we do on our end. Yeah, it was it was in the application. Where we asked them for to. Yep. So it's in the actual application form, uh, George, it's in section D. Section B? D. D as in dog. It's like oh. page four. Okay, so in D, uh, okay, yeah, here we are. Uh, yeah, so estimate cost per ton based on kelp funding. Yeah, so you basically you just get the tons of greenhouse gases and the amount that you're asking uh, kelp for and, uh, and divide one into the other. That's correct, yeah. And please include assumptions or documents used in, to calculate, okay. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> Any other questions that people have? Jessica, I, I noticed that there's a question in the uh, chat box from the District of Invermere. Oh, apologies, I didn't scroll down. Um, <clears throat> there's a question asking to share more about the matched BC Hydro funding. Perhaps uh, someone from the ministry could elaborate on what that is? I think what I was answering was the someone had asked about if they could use BC Hydro funding that was going towards the project as match funding. And so I said yes. I'm not sure. Um, I forget now what funding they were talking about BC Hydro. Jessica, do you remember who the, the first one who asked the question was? Might be worth unmuting the call to... <coughs> Darla. Yeah, so Darla Simpson had asked the original question about BC Hydro funding. I don't know whether, Darla, you're still there and able to identify what funding you were um, thinking about? Yeah, we've received funding for energy studies, and then um, there will be incentive funding for BC Hydro if the project is approved as well. Was that through any type of um, funding program or just a direct relationship you have with BC Hydro? Uh, those are standard funding programs. Um, there is an application process through BC Hydro to be approved. Um, but uh, I, my, well, my understanding is that they're, they're fully subscribed right now, but they're still accepting applications for 2017. 
I think it's important to note that um, each proponent's funding sources are individual. Um, we do have a link on our webpage for under community resources for a funding guide that um, proponents can have a look through um, if they need assistance in determining where to receive funding sources from. So again, that webpage will be listed at the end of our webinar. Um, uh, for your further resources. It'll have uh, information based on our round one and our round two um, and information on eligibility as well as the resources I've mentioned with a funding guide for proponents. Great, thank you. Michelle from Vancouver, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Um, we have a project that we are likely to submit, uh, and it starts slightly before April 1st, 2017, and will end after that, and later in 2017. I just want to make sure I, when when um, it's written total project cost, do you want only the project cost in the eligible time frame, or do you want uh, all project costs, including pre-April 1st? Hi there, it's Leah with Energy and Mines. Um, the application should state the entire project cost, um, recognizing that if your application is successful, the eligible cost will post April 1st. For so, reimbursement. For reimbursement, correct. So if you've got eligible expenses that you're seeking reimbursement um, from kelp, for, for just the kelp portion, all of those receipts will, will need to be uh, post April 1st. Okay, but so I should make it clear in here that the total project cost of $100, $50 or before, $50 or after, and I'm asking for $10 from Kelp. Great, can you just repeat that? So let's say I, the total project cost was $100. Yep. $50 before April 1st and $50 after April 1st, and right. let's say I was seeking $10 from kelp, uh, then I just write 10 out of the 50, the latter 50. No, 10 out of the 100. So total project costs are for the whole project. If your project starts before April 1st, then, um, then your total project costs, let's say, go from February 2017 to, assuming, September 2017, then they span that whole period, but the only costs that you can submit to CALP for reimbursement are those after April 1st. Correct. I guess I was just making sure that I can't ask for more dollars after April 1st than the amount of money I spend after April 1st. Correct. Okay, that's good. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any other questions people would like to ask? Yes, I see that there's a question from the Township of Langley. You guys can go ahead. Hi, uh, so my, my question is uh, with regard to the letter of support for Section G. So say um, uh, Township of Langley, our organization, uh, provides 80% uh, or $80, and we're asking $20 from CALP. Do we still need a letter uh, from our finance department indicating that uh, we are capable of providing that $80, uh, given the fact that that was approved by our council? Yes, any um, information regarding your funding sources um, like comp would be included in your application. Okay. So Thank if you, you have something that's written, approved by council, like if you can point to that evidence that you could submit, then that, that could take the place of a letter from your finance. Thank you. Shows us the evidence. Thank you. Great, thank you. Anybody else? <clears throat> Anyone who's on the phone that's not able to access the chat window? You can go ahead and speak up if you'd like to ask a question. Another question. 
20 minutes in? No, 40 minutes in. Christina, I don't know if there's any other points that you guys would like to make on behalf of the ministry. Um, Jessica, just it's Naren here. Hi, everyone. Um, just another question from uh, uh, Leslie. And uh, she's just wondering if uh, somebody else can review the webinar after the fact. But the intention here is that we are going to re be recording the webinar and it will be made available. Um, where are we putting it available? Do we know that yet? Or? Uh, yep, the recording. Posted on our um, on our web page. I think Michelle from Vancouver other... has. Hello. Go ahead. Right, that was yeah. That was Michelle from Vancouver, I believe, trying to ask another question. Yeah. Sorry. Um, just looking ahead, I appreciate we're looking at 2017-2018, and this was a three-year funding program. Do you have any sense as to whether this program will continue beyond the 2017-2018 fiscal year? Uh, we're not sure. I'd say we'll find out budget day <laughs> in uh, in mid-February. But it's definitely, you know, it's a program that's been highly oversubscribed. So we're we're hopeful that it, that it will continue. Thank you. There's a question from Jerry Little that asks, if the scope of their project has changed, can they ask for additional funding? Uh, yes. Can I get a little bit more um, detail in that question? Jerry, if you'd like to unmute and expand on your question, you can go ahead. Jerry, are you still connected? Right, that may need to be a follow-up question that um, we can try to get back to Jerry after. Yeah, I think just to clarify, like, so if the you know if the project needs more kelp funding um, due to a scope change, that would that would be fine. The I'd say the scope change like if it's that the project has expanded um, then that would be fine but if um, if it's swapping out one project for another project then uh, that would be a concern because they're you know we selected a certain number of proponents to move to the application stage based on uh, the types of projects that were submitted so if it was a complete swap out of one project for another where they were totally different, then it would be best to speak with us first just to make sure that it is still one that that is worth submitting an application for. But generally, if, if what you're talking about is an expanded impact project, but it's um, in principle the same project to what you submitted, then, then yeah, it would be acceptable to ask for more health funding. I think to elaborate on an example, the purchasing a higher efficiency equipment um, that may require a little bit more kelp funding. If the funds are available, it would definitely be something we would um, we would look into providing. Hope that helps. <laughs> I think just in general, too, over the next week or so, um, if any of the folks on the phone who are preparing applications want to have one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations with us or you know, send quick email questions about their applications, and we're happy to, to chat with you folks individually to, um, yeah, with any other questions you have about your applications or your projects. Yep. Oh, well, there's a note from Jerry that he's having mic issues, um, but you have answered the question perfectly, so that's good. Great, Jerry. Thank you. Any other questions? Naren, does your group have any other um, advice or comments that you would like to make sure people consider when completing their applications? I think we're um, I think we're pretty good on this end. Um, we'll just uh, I think we'll close with with Leah. Um, Christine, anything? 
No, I think the only thing um, just we're we've gone through two review periods, right? <laughs> The, the main point, and I know Jessica, you mentioned it in your call, is that whole like be concise and like provide the information that you know that we're able to use to really um, uh, rationalize your responses in each of those sections. But really being concise, there's yeah a lot of applications that we go through, and it's um, it's important that we're able to um, to find the information quickly to. Um, to come to a decision, I guess. That's the, the one yeah. main piece of advice I, I'd yeah. suggest. Yeah. And just to reiterate, um, uh, any contact um, that you may need from the program, please don't hesitate to send us an email and request either a call back or send us an email with your question and we'll research it and get back to you um, before the program deadline. And once again, you should be able to find um, quite a bit of information on our web page. You should see it there now, www.gov.bc.ca slash the Energy Leadership Program. And again, our email is kelp at gov.bc.ca. Well, I guess we'll wrap that up. Thanks, everybody, and thanks. I'm Jessica and Tom for hosting a very informational webinar today. Um, if, if there's no more questions at hand, then um, I guess we'll end this session. All right. Bye to everybody. Bye. Thank you.